Hello and welcome back to Voicecraft, a medium for artful and experimental conversations that seek to share insight into the nature of psyche, culture and our relationship to an evolving world at the turn of an age. Well, gentlemen, lovely to be here with you in this space. We've just had a brief little introduction to the introduction where a notion of remembering the future came through, which I'm sort of interested to inquire into. Um, I know as well that the two of you have recently had appearances on a few other podcasts where some of the listeners to this will have also ventured. So on the Emerge podcast with Daniel Thorson, also on the Stoa. And so among some segment of our audience, your ideas and frameworks are becoming, I think, increasingly familiar, you know, in a time where um, they're dearly needed. So both of you describe your theories, at least parts of them, obviously interested in many things as meta psychologies. So broadly speaking, the domain or area where the various ways that we relate to psychology as well as philosophy and metaphysics to some extent are sort of brought together with some kind of cohesion so that we can relate to these various ways we come to understand psyche, psychology, both the science of it, but then also perhaps the living artfulness of it and the ethics of it all in yes. one kind of um, container framework way of relating and um, that's quite a beautiful thing, something that I've been sort of gravitating towards probably for most of my life, to be honest with you. And so I wrote to you in an email yesterday that this conversation didn't feel like a um, surprise to me or I'm not sure if that's the word I use, but unexpected. It felt like it was coming down the mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for that reason It's because I have this um, deep interest in also coming into some form of coherence or clarity with um, the nature of psyche and what we're doing and how it functions and um, why one thing relates to another and um, like everyone else sort of meeting a world in um, some form of fractured state where there's quite a bit of chaos and awful lot of complexity how can we re relate to that in a way that's um, coherent how can we form a language and representation system together that is both um, can be heartfully held authentically expressed and also um, have the capacity to relate to each other and the world in a way that can hold together in a way that can invite real true seeing of each other in it so it really is you know wonderful work you're both doing and I have tremendous respect for it so I just like to begin by by saying that and sort of um yeah just um I'm very much very much looking forward to this I suppose for the sake of those people listening um and for those watching although they can put faces to names a little bit easier I am speaking here with Zach Stein and Greg Henriquez is that how you pronounce your name, Greg? I've heard it pronounced. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's like uh, me and Henry Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know if I'm going to think about that every time when I say it, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's my adolescent history coming through there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's Greg, and uh, yeah. Zach's voice will be Zach's voice will be the other one. Um. <laughs> so, yeah. Welcome to you both. Um, Thank you. You used the phrase remembering the future just before we began this little recorded part. Zach, I'm <clears throat> curious as to what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, well, I, I had said that this was a phrase I got from Barbara Marks Hubbard, mm -hmm. who had worked with uh, me and Gaffney and Wilbur at the Center for Integral Wisdom, but I believe she got it from Tilia de Chardon. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's actually, it's actually something that you find echoed throughout um, kind of modern mysticism or evolutionary mysticism. Um, and 
one of the ways that I kind of played with it in the field of human development was realizing that it's actually one way of speaking about human maturity is actually that you have a consistent memory of the future, meaning that that there is a future <laughs> and that you're responsible for it. Uh, and that was that notion that was spoken about then, you know, um, Tilliard or Bindo, uh, and of course, you know, Ken Wilbert, folks like that, and a lot of your model, Greg, the, the full stack of all, with all the <laughs> joint points, that's the, the evolutionary unfolding, which is deep time history. And then for Tilliard Darshardan, it's like, remember that. And then remember that there's a future that could be as <laughs> long or longer. I mean, like, so there's this weird way of how when we've got the full notion of cosmogenesis and cosmological evolution, deep cosmic time, and then geological time in terms of the geosphere, and then evolutionary time, thanks to Darwin with the biosphere. And then so Tilliard's like, so what's the future of the neosphere look like? Totally. <laughs> like when we get the emergence of the self-reflective justification systems and cultural producing uh, species, um, they are the only ones in, in the universe ostensibly who have a memory of the future. So it's a strange mystical way of speaking, mm -hmm. but it was, we were, and uh, yeah, we were kind of trying to set the intention. And so that was one of the intentions we used to set quite a lot um, yeah. uh, when Barbara, when Barbara was holding space at the center for integral wisdom. That's, I love that. It, you know, one of the most, it just speaks to me because one of the most profound moments I had was actually the, in 1997, you know, I was thinking and, you know, the tree of knowledge fell out of me. Um, I mean, 30 seconds, it was just sort of drawing. Um, and for me, remembering the future, it, it, it basically, when I saw that, um, I had known all along that that's right. You know, so there's also this other kind of reality that I'd never known that. But when I saw it, I instantaneously knew that I knew it all along. It was like my body had remembered, you know, what it was in a way. Um, so a lot of wisdom traditions will talk about, you know, insight really is uncovering what you already know. Um, and so and when I think about also the remembering of the future, obviously, I also love the comment, try to be a good ancestor. That's a good way to remember the future is there. Right. Um, and it's the case that when I, when you were talking, since you went to uh, the newosphere and dear Tardin, it just spoke to me and basically like my experience of that, of that TOK moment was sort of like, um, it just aligned me in the cosmos in a particular way of past, present and future. Um, that was, well, it was quite profound, at least for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of the, the the fundamental importance of participation and how that relates to this um moment we're in in history right now where there are so many ways of making sense of the world and so many have broken down and there's so many terms and so many frameworks so much complexity so many different responses to that whether overwhelm and sometimes um you know we we come upon a way of making sense something that we feel like it fits together and then we hold on to it quite tightly and we start to confuse the map for the territory sure and then the mystical part of this that I relate to very, say, f fervently is that this process of remembering, sort of coming to understanding of how things fit together or a kind of connectedness, that's also, I'm thinking of a deeply valued state of being um, where perhaps one doesn't feel like necessarily the authority or when one's not getting one's sense of significance from some sort of external authority, but is an actual proximal touch with just being okay here, mm. you know, that, that the, 
the way of relating to consciousness in that mode is something that is I'd say actually it's of um this might not be very tight language but of that essence of dignity right there's something fundamental that we participate in that is not and cannot be owned in conception by another and is somehow the portal through which we peer through the world and our ways of making sense we peer through it and then we can use language and we can use representational systems to help us put things together and create pathways to help us remember again and relate to the various other ways people are coming up with words and images to express where they are it's just something i i keep in mind when we speak about things like meta psychologies for instance because we've spoken about sort of learning difficulties before we started recording and it's like mm -hmm. i i know i i can go through a process where the the forgetting you know the doubting of my own worthiness worthwhileness to actually participate at all but mm. then there's this other sense of <laughs> you don't have to know the answers right now and, and yet we can somehow be in right relationship to the unfolding of them and of things just wondering if that's dr drawing anything forth for you guys i mean <clears throat> uh for me it, it reminded me of when Maslow, or Abraham Maslow, uh, the great developmental psychologist, wrote about the being, what he called the being realm, which was basically the levels of uh, development beyond uh, the deficiency realm. So you start out needing things from the world, from the environment, including, as you were saying, like the the esteem you get. Uh, mm -hmm. like you're regulating love. your love, belongingness, but then institutional positioning. And as you're saying, kind of like, there's a way you can step out of that, which for Maslow, stepping out of the deficiency realm into the being realm is when just the, your sense of value is a given that you don't need to get it from an external source anymore. Uh, and also the sense of inherent dignity and meaningfulness of the world becomes apparent. It doesn't need to be linguistically mediated and explained uh it's just kind of there in the vibrant reality of like your your field your perceptual field so and that's always been interesting uh and uh the, the way he did that research where he basically went around interviewing people <laughs> the most impressive people he could find and it was a snowball sample uh where one self-actualized person made an introduction to another one and and it grew but there was that consistent sense of describing that kind of experience you were describing, Tim, which is um, uh, he speculated, uh, you know, what the human species, what the person was ultimately for. It's kind of like if you're looking at a species of butterfly, do you find the healthy, most vibrant, amazing butterfly you can find? You'd be like, okay, that's the one that's actually the kind of exemplar of the species and that we should study and like or do you find the ones that haven't been well nourished and they weren't kind of in the right environment and their wings are ragged and you're like oh no this is what a butterfly is right so Mazo was like i think we have to go with <laughs> you take these ones that it was just really humming on all cylinders for them and they got to a position to go self transcending self-actualizing into self-transcending and then you look at these guys and you're like, okay okay and girls and of people of all races <laughs> and cultures and creeds uh and you say oh no that's what the human potential actually is so that's like the birth of the human potential movement in many ways was maslow's work um scott barry kaufman just wrote a great book on this yeah. uh, actually it's right in my <laughs> it's right it's, in it's my very, book it, it's good i mean i could yeah. you know there are there are issues with it as there are with all books but but just to resuscitate Mazo, because this theory is so important. Um, and this is one of those things, like you're saying, Tim, we're in a culture where it's the deficient, it's very hard to get out of the deficiency realm. And there are a lot of pseudo gratifications for what should be actual being realm experiences. 
So we simulate the being realm as if <laughs> we're actually self-transcending and self-actualizing when we've been radically stunted. So um, yeah, so that's what that's what it raised for me when you were saying that uh, that this is actually. Uh, kind of a it's a kind of experience the experience you're describing it's a kind of experience and it's an extremely important one in terms of understanding what the human being is what what personhood can be and maybe ought to be um that would be where i took that yeah i'm curious greg so you have S scott's book did you did you engage much with Mazo? i found him a, a, a fascinating figure um i I, cert I gauge more with Rogers than with Maslow and the humanistic right. movement, partly because yeah. Rogers became so central to the psychotherapeutic work. He was a um, practitioner, Maslow was a theorist. Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly was influenced by Maslow's uh, and I be internalized the human potential movement. I mentioned before uh, when we were talking that one of the big things was the sociologist view of the double hermeneutic, but the human potential movement also got the naturalistic fallacy concern going in me right. uh, in relationship to what we say we are, what we focus on uh, from a descriptive perspective. I will say I went in a slightly different direction, Tim, when you were talking, partly because where my head's been lately, I, you know, my journey has been really to pretty strongly develop the logos. Um, I've been working more on centering my phenomenology um, and the isness dimension. My friend Rob Scott, will, uh, you know, really instilled the isness word in me recently, um, and and in part over the last year, I've been dealing with some conflicts, like with my work in various ways um, that got mildly significant at various times, um, and. So one of the things that I wish that I handled differently um, was I reacted against a reaction uh, that cut my dignity in a way that then revealed a vulnerability um, that um, I, I basically located my dependency. You have to see me a particular way. I'm a good guy. <laughs> I've done all of this. And then to be undercut and betrayed um, which is what it felt like from my vantage point in a very, very unfair way, um, activated a rage in me and, and, uh, and uh, indignant um, uh, element in me that then caused a regression, um, which then was shaming because then it was like, oh my God, look at that vulnerability. Um, part of my own psychological reconstituting um, has been focused then on what is that sequence of ego placement, reaction to me, reaction to the reaction, um, and whether or not I can get to another place of centering? I was pretty centered, but obviously I would react to a strong, unfair reaction. And now I'm actually saying, I actually don't know that I even need to react to the reaction. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's just sort of layered and I'm cultivating another layer of centeringness in being um, that when you were talking about sort of then finding, I heard some sort of maybe some neurotic doubt or some questioning, also the chaos around us um, about what's going on. I definitely have been cultivating the drop into centeredness um, and, and the appreciation of the presence of now from my phenomenological vantage point. And I've also loved the fact that actually that moment is a beautiful intersection of the ontic reality and my epistemology and ontology all at once. Like the interior vantage point is a unique, whatever the reality is that it's representing, but just in and of itself, it is the essence of both reality, knower, known, beingness and i'm very much um finding that i'm trying to drink that in and appreciate it regularly so that's where i, I went to a more mm. place there mm. yeah i feel how both of your responses are very much um resonant with where i was coming from there's another piece 
that was in it that was to do with the kind of um when you mentioned greg uh, that in about a 30 second period uh, much of your tree of knowledge system sort of fell out of you it's 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 also something like that i was sort of conceiving it's like we <laughs> the truths of things or at least like the processes that we might undergo the transcendental conditions the transcendental processes the modalities of psyche in sort of zach's meta psychology language there are these innate things innate dynamics that we necessarily jam with that we necessarily live through and live with and there's a certain coming into awareness of self as well as of course relationship it's coming into awareness of relationship and its dynamics that has us all together if we could only see humble before the dynamics of relationship itself and in that the 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 notion then of what we're naming the things becomes important as a justification system um absolutely and becomes important in so far as how we then sort of treat each other in relation to acting these things out and holding that with integrity but there's something about the unfolding of life itself that has us all in a place of deep equality and humility in relationship to it that i see as a kind of dignity and I, and that's definitely coming through both with what you're with what you're saying there um the reason i'm sort of saying all of this at all is because I think actually in many, in many deep ways, um, both of your work actually helps in scaffolding what I was just referencing in some regards. Um, and so it's, it's extremely important. And it's also to be held with a certain kind of um, preciousness. Um, it's to be held in collaboration and I just find it so significant because we're taking seriously the naming of fundamental dynamics. And this is, this is such, a, um, such an important thing and also such a, there's so much responsibility inherent to that. And, and I, I, um, I've experienced this sense of responsibility a lot when I find myself in a position of someone asking me a question about something and I sort of take it upon myself to try and answer it in some regard because I, it's so often that I can be so deeply confused. Mm. So anyway, I, I suppose that's just me speaking to, in some sense, the significance of the task you know um and that there's this just this inherently um challenging dynamic there you know i once wrote a paper where i was trying to speak about ineffability and i i failed it and it was the most <laughs> important work i ever did at the time because i truly engaged with something you know and i gave it i gave it a good shot but one of the one of the responses I got was like, look, like trying to F the ineffable. I got many responses that weren't, I would say, particularly appropriate from a philosophy professor in gra in graduate school. That is, um, but that was kind of one of them. Like, why, like the, this effing the ineffable? You won't find philosophy here. You know, that's not what we're about. Um, and nevertheless, we have this um, seeking heart in us that consistently finds itself in relationship with the ineffable and we necessarily come up with maps to help chart the course chart 
our paths extend the hand so that others on their own unique paths can take some steps along it and that we might all sense together some sort of light through the fog and so um this is really work you guys are you guys are doing i guess a question out of this there's so many questions out of this but but is this is this like the significance of that and the kind of the doubt that might, do you experience doubt that comes along with what you do in relationship to this good question <laughs> um yeah that could be a couple of things um i don't experience any doubt that i'm onto something deep and profound i have no doubt about that um what exactly it is has been <laughs> What exactly it is that I did is definitely been an obsession, you know, of mine. And you hear me, and I'm, I'm upset. You know, my logos mind mm. um, is obsessed with, you know, I've internalized my father, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I have a very good relationship. But I, he's a professor and critical, and you know, kind of what it, that philosopher potential of, you know, prove it to me even beyond what would be you know, reasonable at some level, you know, and I, I can internalize that. And so it's sort of like, I want to be able to answer that. And the reason I analytically obsess about the problem of psychology is because actually I'm at a place where I say, kind of like Einstein's equations, you just know, there it is. Here's the logic that you can't answer this. This is where it comes from. And this is a 10 times better answer than anybody else gives. And it solves a whole bunch of problems. Boom. Okay. So I, I do have a deductive uh, angle on some of the key elements, uh, which goes, you know, to my heart and to my cells. <laughs> Sometimes they like, nope, that's what it is, you know. Um, so there's that. The, the doubt has to do with, well, I get very confused why my system sees things so clearly as both being true and valuable and essential and important important down to my cells and then why that doesn't why others don't i mean <laughs> it's like why it's been i mean you know i mean now I, you know i'm talking with more people who have had i think similar courses you know and it is affirming to hang with zach and basically okay but man you know for 20 years you're just sort of like this is super important it's like a, I, I would often say you know, when I first developed the tree of knowledge, I hid the diagram. I hid it. Okay. And because I was under the impression that somebody else looked at the diagram, it would be, it'd be like a car in front of you. It was like this miracle car, you know, and anyone else could see that. Um, so I have gone, had serious doubts about um, the contrast of my experience in the interpersonal world that I live in. And so my heart and soul is like, mm, I know what that is. And I wouldn't have any choice really to pursue this. This is, I mean, but really the soul says you're going after this, you know? Um, but then the doubt is, well, what exactly is it? And why does it seem so clear at so, and so pristine and so deep to me and so oftenly unable to be seen or is just so dismissed or you know i showed it to dan dennett you know he gave me one re word reply on an email and i was kid unsurprising <laughs> <laughs> unsurprising oh you know? jeez never, never heard anything i was like and it's like how how is that possible how are my cells telling me this and dan dennett is is uh, gave me a one word reply and edward wilson when talking those are my you know young adult years of of doubt and confusion um you know and and relationship to father and all of that and you know i still carry that i i don't i get my doubt more is like much less ego bound and much more like do we actually have time to change the world in the time between worlds that we have, or is this thing gonna go off a fucking cliff? <laughs> that's really, that's now my more, my more practical doubt isn't about my ego, but it's about my children. You know, like, I mean, what, what kind of world are they gonna grow up in? That's really where my, uh, I'm not worried about being, you know, 
elevated like I was when I was 30. Um, I'm more like, I don't give a shit about that. I'm more like, are we actually going to be able to yoke ourselves together to clarify what is and ought to be and cultivate a transformation so the Titanic doesn't run into the goddamn iceberg? I don't know about that. Yeah, I agree with that last sentiment. <laughs> you know, in, in many ways, that's uh, the crux of the matter. I mean, you know, Tim, to your, like, so theoretically, do I experience doubt is kind of what you're asking. Like, do I think maybe I could potentially be wrong about uh, some of the major distinctions in my metapsychology, or is it more like, do I doubt my uh, capacities as a teacher or even the legitimacy of my teacherly authority, let's say in civil society, right? Which is, I think, uh, perhaps That's a deeper nice vein where, where doubt could be there. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. theoretically as a, you have to doubt and your point about ineffabilities is well taken. Like, um, you know, and what's interesting as a developmental psychologist to realize ineffability is always the horizon of your language game, but the horizon of your language game always grows in increasingly hierarchical complex ways. So what's ineffable to a seven or eight year old <laughs> ceases to be ineffable when you learn 10,000 more words. Um, uh, and, uh, so this is also the case with theoretically, like when you build a new model, you actually shed light on the stuff you know you don't know. Like there's new always at the edges. There's always stuff where you're like, oh my God, precisely because I now know this, I just see a hundred things now that I don't right. know. This is one of the dialectics of science. Um, Kurt Fisher, my advisor, uh, before he passed um, away, we were working on this concept of dark knowledge and this was the notion like, in relation to knowledge, there always exists dark knowledge, <laughs> which is the ignorance the knowledge reveals by virtue of the knowledge being discovered. And this is a dialectic that plays out in scientific progress and in individual development, as I was pointing out. Like, the more you learn, the more you learn what you haven't learned yet, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, in that sense, like, yeah, I'm, uh, it's like, I, it's kind of a, there's like an equilibrium disequilibrium. I go through periods theoretically where I'm like, whoa, I'm really got, I'm gone to this. And then other, other periods after usually some significant reading or some significant exchange with other folks where I'm like, oh man, now I'm confused again. And that's good. Like yeah. when I used to teach and gra graduate students, I'd be like, if at the end of this course, you are not confused and you have not actually made an effort to learn. Paid attention. <laughs> Exactly. Cause like these models are huge and like to bump them up and against one another, like, and if you're not confused then you're missing something. So, so I actually try to find books that are confusing um, in a good way, in the sense of like, I always have a book that I'm reading that's, that's above my pay grade <laughs> so that I'm like challenged. Uh, so yeah, in the, within the realm of theory, I think there's, there's and doubt's not the right word because it's it's more of the awareness of the dark knowledge. It's a kind of epistemic humility, something like yeah. that. Yes, yes. Uh, in the realm of like the legitimacy of teacherly authority in civil society, that's a more complex question. Yeah, um, no, I hear and you. Uh, I do have. Uh, I'm very conflicted about that. Like, I turn away a lot of podcasts and don't know what I think about this whole talking head thing. Um, yeah. Uh, in part because of the celebrity culture and uh, the takeout culture and the scapegoating culture and other things, it feels dangerous. Uh, and then also in part because I know as an educator that this kind of broadcast didactic transmission stuff, even when it's really good long form, isn't really the main event educationally. Um, sure. The main event educationally is these other things. Um, so what that's where I do it? have kind of like doubts. What I mean is like... Uh, the internet is basically like TV and radio on steroids. It's actually not taking advantage of the essential deep structural property of the digital as it would be defined by McLuhan and let's say Alexander Bard. Like mm -hmm. YouTube's just a TV with a million channels. It's not taking advantage of what the digital provides, which is the kinds of interconnectivity and specifically memory <laughs> uh, and the ability to do things like blockchain and other stuff. So the educational hub vision that I lay out in the book 
takes advantage of the deep structural affordances of the digital as a new uh, kind of like evolution of human media technology. Um, yeah. And it doesn't rely on the transmission through screens of broadcast, <laughs> uh, of broadcast format. Um, and now it's mini cast because you're broadcasting to just a thousand people or something. But the modality is one of you send out a signal and they receive the signal. And maybe there's right. a little bit back. And that's what we think is like the digital is that we have like chats at the bottom of stuff. <laughs> uh, but that's not really taking affordance of the yeah. digital. Um, so we haven't seen the educational affordances of the internet at all lately. And so I wonder sometimes when it's like doing the podcast and stuff, if I should actually instead spend that same time doing the other stuff that I'm doing, which is working on that problem, which is how to actually fix the internet so that it works as an educational thing instead of just a, like an extraction and attention capture thing. Um, where even the best educational stuff I think is mostly re redux of, um, of, uh, what we got with the electric, which was, you know, broadcast, um, broadcast stuff. So, so I felt like a little bit like a tangent, but that's, that's part of that's, that's about my doubt of like, well, what is civil society? What is civil society now? And how do we actually affect it with the things we say, you know, like right. where, where do words actually have power? Is it here or is it in a private conversation where you're building something <laughs> that's going to completely change Right. what this even looks like and, and makes possible. So and I don't know. Um, so I think I've this is it. neither of those things, mm -hmm. but it's, but, but it's, it's clambering its way out of one and is unsure if it's the other. Um, and so this is, this is feels like one of the really resonant directions we could have and are going together. It was something that was sort of with me in that ineffable space of, is this appropriate to speak about? Is this a truth? Are these truths that we can hear navigate together? Is this reality we can hear navigate together? Um, because I think this is, I would say exactly the thing, but it's close to, I think, I was um, speaking with with Forrest uh, yesterday, yesterday morning or the or the day before, about some sort of middle ground between open source and then your absolutely private competitive, and that there. And that this is an area in which he himself is um, working and doesn't have. A definitive answer and i think it speaks into this quite quite well um what i can say is that the kind of meta route we took to beginning to apprehend this what to me looks like the emergence of the dynamics of a new space so stepping into the digital understanding how we're relating to each other in it what are the kind of niches what are the structural dynamics that are forming how can we be in a, the right kind of flow with them rather than just get captured by them um are all like deeply central to what i see playing out in what's sometimes referred to as like the meta web or just the the loose affiliation of podcasts like the stoa and various places that are they're experimenting with different ways of gathering and communing online where there's a deep caring attention paid to learning so they're kind of mutual learning environments that are seeking to source and bring in many voices um and sort of self-reflexively understand what is of importance. But I think we can already note, as that's happening, we can then um, have, an, have a discussion about and actually relate to in a deep existential sense what some of the meta values, what they in fact must be in order for there to be ethical communication, enduring interaction. And so that's the kind of conversation that would look like it's appropriate to have 
as this particular new medium here, one of many conversations we could have that looks appropriate to have in precisely this regard. Because the way we've kind of navigated ourselves here, there's an awful lot of people who won't find that immediately appealing. So there's an element of exclusive exclusivity about it. Like I began by saying how much respect I have for both of your work, yet we didn't exactly explicate what that work was, which which I don't, which I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful uh, to, to the audience in doing that, right? I'm, I'm truly not. It's just that we couldn't really. We'd have to take 10, 15, 20 hours if we wanted. And so that has to take place in other places. Um, there are ways for people to not just comment, but have conversations about this. I'm trying to understand how to extend invitations for people to participate in conversations. There's a network for that to happen. Having so many conversations with people, trying to understand what is a kind of guild type system or what's in this middle space where we can gather and share, but then also have a, a somewhere that's protected, somewhere that's not uh, kind of a, doesn't just put things out to be consumed like what are what's the what's the way to be together in the new territory that's emerging which can actually help link things and appropriately extend invitations so as to cuz this is a project of change fundamentally change that's upon us but also we look around and see a whole bunch of structural dynamics that are deeply unhealthy and so there's seems to be a deep interest in modulating something modulating one's context to be something altogether more loving and enduring and regenerative and so what is power what is influence i see people grappling with these kinds of questions that kind of comes into this notion of teacherly authority just a little bit like is it a, is this my lookout to speak into is this something i can take caring responsibility for or am i kind of not so much speaking into the wind, but um, sharing a whole bunch of information and, and, and energy even just at that level, which um, a channel isn't established to appropriately conduit. And so these are, these are such important and deep questions, but it seems like, um, well, what attitude can we take into that process? What, what way of relating to each other as we, self-reflexively try to understand where we're standing mm -hmm. where we are that can that can ground the process like when we remember the future and we remember what it might take to get there and beyond what can we say about what we're doing what process are we engaging with perhaps ethically what must we take into account and maybe could we could we render this in some i don't want to jump necessarily to say hey let's make this a make a triple out of this um but but i but i actually think there is one um and it's interesting because you know i understand this way of thinking zach is something that's deeply a part of your cognitive framework um and also greg i know that you've spoken about in quite a few places your meta values of um dignity integrity and well-being i've actually made those or well, variants of them because i was thinking about them two of the words the same words although expressed in ways that maybe you wouldn't given certain commitments to naturalism and not that i'm committed to supernaturalism but they had different you know slightly different wordings behind them sure and the other one, well-being, uh, I was sort of calling well-fullness. But I've sort of made these a kind of, I put these in a little short stanza of a covenant. And who the fuck am I to write a covenant? I don't know what a covenant is, but I'm just trying to be honest about, hey, if we have some conversations, here's, some, here's a way to kind of, that I'm, that I'm aspiring to show up as. And I also think it's somehow deeply connected to an appropriate way to be in relationship with transformation. And so all this language to speak about something which is uh, appropriate to speak into, but not mine to name, because these are inherent dynamics, if they are true, enabling of life, enabling of ethical conduct, enabling of endurance. So 
this is something I'm so deeply interested to speak to you both about because mm. maybe what I'm sort of getting at is if we don't know precisely where we are, but we know some things about maybe who we are when we're feeling like we're in loving touch, appropriate, humble relationship with the world. And we also have plenty of intellectual things we can say, or at least the two of you do, about what, what the hell's going on in, in some regards. How do we interact then in this kind of swirling uncertainty of pluralism to find each other and find a way of right coming into right relationship with each other maybe that's enough maybe that's enough to stop there um what kept coming up for me when i i think i said you know i'm sort of feeling my way into the future um that what you reflected on added a lot of texture and the kinds of questions or wonderings um, that would in, be encapsulated. Feeling my way into the future. So um, I, I definitely am guided by those meta values. Um, I am guided by the idea that People being known and valued is really key. I'm guided by the ideas of both being and becoming, uh, as well as doing. Uh, clearly was listening to a little bit of Daniel Schmachtenberger's Dharma work, <laughs> but those are all. Um, so I guess for me, the issue is we are, I mean, you know, I keep, I, uh, I repeat Zach's comment where, you know, the time between worlds, we're feeling our way. There are certain kinds of principles um, that, you know, provide a logical and ethical structure. And then there's the embodiment of, yeah, what feels meaningful uh, to my essence uh, now in, in present. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I, to like yesterday, I was like, you know, uh, after I gave my little talk and then we were, Zach and I were just, were talking. And then I think people were enjoying that. And I just simply felt, Hey, that's a good communitas, right? That's a nice, rich exchange. I think we should be aware of, you know, attention influence dynamics, um, and just check that. I mean, are people fun fundamentally coming together to uh, enjoy the time? Are they feeling connected? Is it informing? Is it potentially growing? Those are the indicators that feel like we're feeling our way into the future in the best ways that we could do. Hmm. I mean, it's a deep question, you know, or the, it's a deep framing your set of re reflections and yours as well, Greg, like, what are you really oriented to do? Um, it's often a hard question to ask, answer, <laughs> you know, like, um, like, as I said, I sometimes wonder, uh, like, well, let me back up. We don't, it's not that we're completely lost in. It's not that we don't know where we are. We actually know a lot of things about where we are. And, um, and some of that is actually related to what we ought to be doing. Um, you know, and sometimes I say this question of kind of where we are is less important than when we are. And this leads us to this notion of the, the time between worlds. And, and then it's also like, what kind of time is it? And I've talked about that. Is it Kronos or Kairos, right? So, or Kairos times, so time between worlds in a chirotic swirl. Um, and so, what that means is that the kind of ethical codes, which are related to this notion of a covenant, a covenant is different from a convention. So, there's the conventional culture and there's covenantial cultures. Um, but anyway, in any case, the strict set of like 10 commandments, your fathers did this, their fathers, fathers did this, you know, you will do this. Um, that works in a 
not when you're in a, when you're not in the time between worlds and when you're not in chirotic spiral time when you're in chronos and when you're in the world right um and so there's this question of kind of like you know what what do values basic evaluative frameworks and kind of north kind of north star first principles first values kind of really look like um and can we even have those conversations which is what's interesting and i believe we're actually facing a kind of like almost adolescent and neurotic avoidance of those questions in our culture and i think there's perhaps some reasons for that uh um so yeah, we, we've I've spoken before, I forget where, but about some of the work Gaffney and I have done in the anthropological common sense. Um, and so this is this notion of not only do we know some things about where we are, but we also know some things about who we are and what the, what personhood is like, what it basically, you know, what used to be called the perennial philosophy. <laughs> these these notions of the the, the intensity of certain values that are resonated across cultures and across time as being central to valued experience as a human um, and and so that's a lot of thing i've been doing lately is about how to bring that language you know we've talked at the center of integralism about a neo-perennialism how to update those ways of speaking and thinking which actually factor the postmodern critique and like yep we got you <laughs> there's there is cross-cultural there is cross-cultural differences and there's been a tendency to you know colonize and homogenize and to make the cultures appear similar even though they're not and but yep. even after you factor that uh, and the the most staunch critics of the most staunch postmodern critics of perennialism who factor that in their footnotes if you read carefully they end up do saying yeah but there are some universals <laughs> you know um so that's just interesting to stop back and think about that, that we're, we're kind of almost led to believe that we don't know where we are, we don't know who we are, that it's all up for grabs, right? And uh, Bascar noted uh, in Dialectic um, that it used to be that ideology was reifying the worldview, but now the ideology is the absence of ideology, which is the absence of a reified worldview. So it's actually the inability to weave the world back together again. Mm -hmm. That's the ideological structure that's maintaining the dominance of the capitalist world system. In fact, the inability to get the synthetic overview of everything, and Greg yeah. explains why people don't want to listen to you, <laughs> because they're they're encased in the simulation of the ideology, which says we don't know where we are, don't, we don't know who we are, anything's up for grabs. Um, right. And in fact, it's not true. <laughs> we, no, we I know. You know, right. We know where we are. We know a lot about who we are. We've been humans on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years and have continuous lineage traditions across all of those spanning. Uh, and so, yeah, so that, that's kind of what have my reaction. It's like, yeah, actually, I pull my values from my ancestors, from my ancestors that were good ancestors to get to this point about what remembering the future means, right? It can be a good ancestor. I said that, Greg, it's not a way of getting to it. So I draw my values from them, these lineage traditions. You know, um, specifically Judaism, um, specifically certain forms of Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, which uh, can give guidance. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that I don't look to science <laughs> uh, at all for that kind of stuff. And I think it's the hegemony of the scientific worldview, in fact, that's led us to have the default assumption to be, we don't know where we are or who we are and everything's up for grabs. Um, and it's like the introduction to sex, ecology, spirituality, where Ken Wilber says basically like, what's the answer to why the Big Bang happened according to modern science? Mm, I don't know, oops. And he's like, what kind of answer is that? That's an extremely, and you say the religious answers are immature, right? But that's a pretty immature answer. You'd be like, mm, I don't know oops, <laughs> it's why it all started. Uh, so there is this sense of like, um, yeah, we've exhausted the explanatory capacity of the natural sciences to provide us with a worldview. And we're, this is part of the why we're in a time between worlds. We've been unworlded, deworlded, um, and told that we don't know where we are, or who we are, that it's all for grabs. <laughs> so we need to figure out how do we weave that back together? 
right. re-world our experience. And that's going to mean saw landing into a new set. And this is that attempt of the neo-perennialism, right? To land into a new set of anthroontological common sense, first principles, first values. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and there's more. I mean, we can even get into what they are, you know? Mm -hmm. Like that choice matters is one of them. Mm -hmm. Totally. <laughs> yeah, I choice. mean, that's a, that's a, I'm sorry, I jumped in there. But it, when I, so I think that it's all, you know, the answer is always contextualized in the frame uh, that you're bringing to bear. So for me, the, the uncertainty is I, the future and what is good. Like, are, are podcasts the way to go? Um, what's going to emerge a year from now? Am I maximizing what I can do to be part of the transition? I, I wonder about that. I, I cannot, I, I can simply feel my way, follow principles and, you know, and lay down the track and see what happens. Um, and and I don't feel a lot of confidence in that, but I don't see how anyone could unless, you know, you were, had a lot more specificity and a lot more maybe power than I have. I don't have a lot of power. But when you, what, if I listen to Zach's comment about that from an ideological frame, I mean, all of that, when I go back to what don't I doubt, it's that what he said is actually a absolutely accurate. And I come from the scientific tradition to tell you that. <laughs> And that we can do better, like that 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 there is that the, it's a myth of of postmodernism or extreme fragmented um, empiricism. And the whole point of it is actually, you know, the physicists think that they have the matter down reasonably well, minus quantum mechanics and general relativity and exactly what triggered the Big Bang. But after that, they're pretty well organized, right? We have standard elementary particle physics, uh, you know, chemistry organized by periodic table. We know natural selection, genetics, and cell theory work. And then you get into, and then it's the brain, okay? And then we get tripped up, and then all of a sudden, psychology unfolds. And, and then we are like, okay, well, now with that, and then how do we live, and then technology, and then, yep, it's all chaos, especially you add the postmodern kicker, right? Which is then adds the critique, and now you have fragmented pluralism with hyper-specialized empiricism, and a fundamental devaluing of the kind of wisdom ideologies that we could be driven by, and that fact that we need to be driven by. And, and that's certainly what I woke up to. And there is, and when I said I had no doubt to my cells that that was accurate, it is simply there are errors that can be corrected, that can be aligned, that can be seen. Hmm. So what's been coming to mind to bring to bear is the role of myth, the role of symbol. Um, and the way I'll open this up is to speak a little bit to where or how I relate to my sense of uncertainty in, in all of this. Uh, one of the ways. <laughs> um, so if we take the idea of the fifth joint point, right, that we're stepping into a new field, a new, um, well, slightly adjacent to that, a new dynamic of technology, this digital age. Mm -hmm. If we say that this is an emergent dynamic, an, an emergent field to be part of, then if we look to our lineage, to what degree can we expect our myths to provide adequate maps for how to relate to the transformations that must play out in order for what? Well, we also get our values in some sense from our lineage. I mean, I can say some words about that, but I, I'd almost don't like to say words about for what, because I sometimes 
I don't feel worthy in a way of just putting words to what ultimately matters. Although I, you know, I do sometimes. To me, it, to me, it looks like for what is to participate in loving transformation. In my mappings, I can't, I don't know, to be pushed in another direction from that. It's like, I know I have to let go of things. But in order to let go of things, I have to deeply care about them. And I, there's no movement. There's no being here. There's no valuing any of this. There's no living if I don't deeply care, if I'm not deeply involved in the loving construction. And then there's finitude, right? And then there's inadequacy of um, holding water with a fork, as sometimes people put something like that, you know. And so there's breathing out and letting go. And then the continual reattachment again. And I think about how human beings and ecology is arranging itself now if we take into account this emergent dynamic of, of technology with that we've stepped outside in some sense of the systems of um, sustainability. And we can manipulate such fundamental parts of that substrate so as to destabilize it all and destroy it. You know, destroy it according to our values of caring about life and being and all these things at all, which are affirmed in this deep sense. So I'm not saying that myth is defunct. I'm not saying that. I'm I'm wondering about the the emergence of myth itself. I'm wondering about the creation of new ways to understand how picking up and letting go and picking up and letting go and refitting ourselves actually is working in this time between worlds in this in this kairos time. And then I'm I'm also thinking about the metaphysical dynamics that make sense of this process. And I'm thinking about whether, whether this um, can be fit in the worldview of the great chain of being. I'm thinking about eternal recurrences. I'm trying to think about the dynamics of creation, which we can be in a continuity relationship with that extends deep into our ancestry as well as deep into our future. And what does, what does that mean for the creation of myth now? Like, are we, can we actually in, in the, in some of these ways, I'm deeply confused and yet somehow, somehow I feel a ground to, be in relationally with regard to all of that. When I began talking, I felt, I felt like I had a potentially a bit more clarity to, uh, to extract out of that. <laughs> I apologize. Remember the ineffable, yeah, but, the ineffable is the limit of your language game. You're and your language right, game right. Totally. Right. totally. I mean, I, if you want to go, Greg, you can, I have some stuff to, I'm holding on to. Though. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, the, the, I think you're speaking to some really, very profound things. I I do have some, you know, frames from where I sit in relation to, to my little garden in relationship to that, you know? Um, and it, it does seem, at least when I'm sitting in it, it seems to um, at least allow me to orient to what you're saying. So my little, I mean, if I just narrate the journey, um, you know, I'm steeped in a new atheist scientific frame that then captures essentially that it is science itself that's sort of, at least as we try to frame human psychology, that's imploding us in many ways. That's my sense. So to go back to Zach's comment, there's a, there's an idea, a fragmented, pluralistic, chaotic ideology um, that I want to sort of, I'm called to twist and then turn and rotate and then see and label, I'm called to label it the tree of knowledge, you know, uh, in, a, in a way that is always was ironic to me. I mean, I, I certainly 
layered that a particular way. And right now in 2015, and then the ultimate flowering of that, the call to then turn that into a theory of knowledge tree in a garden, um, as I sort of felt the relative completion of uh, the scientific frame into the scientific humanistic Moibis loop completion feedback between the humanities and the values and, and all of that, and then situated that as the emergence of the digital takes hold and the possibility or the probability or whatever's going to happen in the complex adaptive plane that arises out of that possibility, it, for me at least, aligns the modernist skepticism, a postmodern value critique, but not nihilism, and a reestablishment of the proper relation of science, mythos, pathos, to then orient us as we move into the adjacent possible of the emergence of the digital. Yeah, it's fascinating because I was going to say, not knowing what you were going to say, Greg, that in fact, the creation of myth is like almost one of the functions of the psyche. And as you know, when Greg reached a certain complexity and completion and coherence of the model, it reached mythic uh, resonance, <laughs> if I can say that. And this is what's so kind of interesting. I, I spoke in the Stoa lecture when I spoke about transcendence, I spoke about symbolic immortality, which is a term that was used by um, Robert J. Lifton um, and mm. who did an incredible work interviewing survivors of Hiroshima, right? So like you mm. were in Hiroshima, Jesus. You, were, you were in Hiroshima and the bomb dropped um, and you had an experience of mythic proportions, which is to say you had a, an erratically inhuman experience on the receiving end of overwhelming technological violence to the extent that many of them believe the world is ending like right. i'm witnessing right. oh, here it happens it's happening the world is ending <laughs> and uh and the way that they were kind of recovered if you can say that from such an experience of course there was physical difficulties but the psychological trauma of the experience of that rift in the kind of existential fabric um was it what lifton would call this re a reweaving of symbolic immortality which is in the realm of symbol and in the realm of myth um and uh which is just to say that yeah part of what this major transformation is about is being in the shadow of the bomb and then all of these other self-induced extinction possibilities which are of mythic proportion um, Absolutely. And, and we actually need something like a new myth and this has been said but i'm saying in like a more technical sense which is to say we need symbols that allow us to connect with reality to the extent that we feel immortal it's a weird thing to say <laughs> but this is lifton's point he's like it used to be the case that and, and uh this is a jungian perspective actually jung said something along the lines of like you know um you need to basically convince your clients that they're immortal and boom, <laughs> like most neuroses are the result of a dysfunction in some, the creation of symbolic immortality. You don't have the resources in your experience and in your culture to see that you're connected with everything, with your ancestors, with the future. Lifton noted that after the bomb, and especially for those people who were hyper aware of its presence, some of the traditional historical candidates for creating your sense of symbolic immortality, which were your lineage, going into the future, your work going into the future, and life on earth going into the future, we're taken away. <laughs> uh, and so that he think, believes we've been in, a, in the whole, and what's interesting, the whole culture has been in a state of neurotic reaction to that subtraction of the possibility of symbolic immortality. That's why we've gone to the last remaining one, which is altered states of consciousness. Basically that, that, that relieve you from your identification with ego and make you feel transcendent connection to reality regardless of if the earth survives or if your family sort of you know family line survives genetic line survives and if your work survives and so that we've over fetishized um, these forms of altered state consciousness as a modality of 
getting some tinge of symbolic immortality, but we've lost entirely the language game of myth creation, of weaving Zach's story into the story of the people and the place and the world in such a way that Zach lives on. So I'm not talking about like, convince yourself that you're actually gonna live forever, like Kurzweil, <laughs> or convince yourself you're gonna live forever in heaven, right? Like mm -hmm. let's say a Islamic terrorist, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, that this is a richer, you know, non-naive, simplistic way of thinking about what is the mechanism that actually allows us to live without utter terror <laughs> right. of the fact we're, we're gonna die. And we now live in a world of overwhelming technological violence where we could have a self-induced extinction of the species. Like, so this is all to say that, yeah, we're, there's, there, I've said before, there's gonna be a lot of emergent religious phenomenon in the next decade. Um, new religions emerging, cult activity on the rise. Uh, and <laughs> healthy new forms of symbolic immortality and the weaving of myths. Um, and one more point, which is kind of a point of like theoretical nuance, which is just that, you know, the idea that the archetypes that were expressed in the myths of the past will not remain relevant is kind of like saying that, uh, well, once molecules emerge, then, you know, atoms really aren't relevant anymore. <laughs> or something like that, you know, or once the, the multicellular organism emerges, then cells are not important anymore. But in fact, the idea of the archetype is that there are, these are basic root metaphors that are part of the psyche and different cultural times and different historical epochs will emphasize some rather than others and new ones absolutely do emerge. And as we're witnessing, I think now, but there is continuity. Um, and this is one of the things I think we're at risk of forgetting to the, to, to the extent that we're living it in psychopathology, that there are dimensions of human experience, which actually, are, if you neglect them, <laughs> then they're going to be like, basically like gods that haunt you, you know, right. like big, powerful images and metaphors of humanity, which are like, have put out, uh, but they're there. Um, and which by so, the yeah, way, Zach, yeah. That, yeah. That's exactly why your meta psychology needs to be broadcasted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Because there are, what are, what's a shorthand for the dimensions, uh, the essential dimensions of our humanity that have to ground us as we are in danger of becoming unmoored in the digital landscape, not to mention all the other crazy crap that's going on, which of course is part of the digital, but it's also all of the forces that are pulling us out of our natural state and then so what are the lines to ground us well I, we're overplaying skill development but we cannot lose sight of installment and transcendence right exactly. right you know yeah. and 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 that's not complicated <laughs> i mean you know i mean that's like three things <laughs> right <laughs> it's like three things <laughs> They're big things. Though. They're big. They're big obviously, I'm not, I'm not minimizing you, man. I'm just saying. Three I get it. I get it. And that was the idea, basically. Yeah. I, mean, and I think with yours on. too, with the with the garden as well. Like, because by the way, the the triple, just the three, you're already in the symbolic there, right? Think about right the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In many religious traditions, you have the triple appearing, just natively being symbolic of some kind of reality, and. uh so yeah, there's a parsimony that's necessary, I think, to, in doing metapsychology because you actually want it to be able to scap with people's experience. Um, totally. Like you, so the tree metaphor is perfect because if you hold it well, you can actually, it's like a scaffold or a, like a mnemonic device that allows your judgment to be much more complex than it otherwise would be because you're factoring all of the possible models. So similarly with the big three I laid out, that was the goal, you know, it's just three. Remember, you're building skill, <laughs> but you're also deepening, you know, deepening your personality and character. And are you finding ways of engaging with the symbol and, and awareness itself, and, uh, emotional regulation and things of that nature and the transcendence. So, yeah, so you're right to me. Like, there's a sense in which the clarity that needs to be brought to the psyche about the psyche for the psyche by the psyche. <laughs> Uh, right. That's that's what we're both trying to do. Right. Which it, which modernity modernity killed because it overemphasized science, which actually couldn't solve the goddamn problem. Right. And so Precisely. so then it created the shadow 
<laughs> modernity shadow, uh, right. you know, that now needs to be reclaimed and nourished. Well, and you said it too that uh, you were speaking about some branch of science and said it's a myth. You know? And I'm not saying science is a myth, no way. Science is incredible. <laughs> uh, but when you move out of scientific practice and into scientism, let's say, uh, which is, let's say, part of the shadow of modernity, then you get science as myth. <laughs> uh, and then Lifton made this point about the nuclear bomb, you know, that at a certain point, we had to embrace science uh, and its mythic proportions as a whole civilization because of the power that it wielded over us. And so the mythic dimension of the science industrial complex is extremely important. And so if, if, if the psyche creates myths, like that's one of the things it does, <laughs> uh, then we are in a situation of needing to create new myths, but also of needing myths that are currently holding sway, which are not recognized as myths, to be called out as myths <laughs> and right. put to bed, uh, or at least placed into that realm. It's like, that was interesting that we were really into that for a while, thinking that way. Right. <laughs> but that's right. actually not the way we need right. to think because it's inaccurate, right. et cetera. Um, like if you're miserable, look at a, a commercial and see neurons with molecules. And now you know why you're miserable and go take a pill, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, right. You know, yeah, as a no, myth, totally. as a, as a yep. or, or yep. I mean, or go into some pro the churchlands and learn eliminative materialism that basically tells you your own damn experience is an illusion at some, right. at any level. <laughs> And right. you're just like, well, so you're telling me your beliefs about eliminative materialism are somehow grounded in the physical movement of your atoms. And I need to believe that so that I get rid of right. my beliefs. I mean, yeah. just no, that's like, sorcery. That's sorcery. You know, that's, that's different. That's different. No, and all in the name of all in the name of science. We know that's this right. now. You know, yeah. you guys, you guys, you kids believe stuff, but we're here to tell you. Oh, my. Well, that's God. what you get. You yeah, myth and sorcery and magic. Yeah. And so you also have that element of the science industrial complex, the, the ideological mythic dimension, and then the sleight of hand magic tricks, which include a limited materialism and other overtly performatively contradictory stances, um, including a lot of postmodern stuff. And oh. uh, yeah, the neuromyths are fascinating. There was a whole movement in educational neuroscience to just debunk the neuromyths. And so, so yeah, you're right, Tim, focusing on this important, uh, salvaging the notion of myth from the dustbin saying all not all myths not a pejorative word in fact it's a it's a it's a modality in, in specifically kind of in the insolment camp of how psyche works um and if we if we are unworlded and we're also demythed i don't know if that's a world but we, so we don't live in the myth you know like if you're a union or a you know uh archetypal psychologist like in hillman's uh camp and one of the things you're actually trying to get people to do is to experience their life in mythic proportions um, to give meaning to it that you like you're actually a character here in a very significant story which is you, your own and also this broader world totally. and so that that's one of the things that you probably experience in that being realm that you mentioned more towards the beginning right that it actually the world becomes saturated oversaturated with meaning uh, and gestures take on that mythic, mythic dimension, um, and yeah. So there's a lot. No, it's, I, a, it's a rich vein. No, I, yeah. Totally. I mean, I, my own development is evolving from logos into mythos. I mean, it's completely right. You know, yeah. and 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 recognizing that you know the lies I was fed basically uh, about what as myth, mythos equals myth it's like no mythos is, is like essential right. to our souls right exactly now that's a very important distinction mythos and myth that specific myths are, yeah. are that they're specific myths but mythos is that function of psyche which actually gives us sustenance that we need <laughs> which is the sustenance of meaning significance you know and archetypal connection you know uh so yeah there's there's, and I, like I said, I'm, that's coming. Like, I don't know what it's going to look like, um, but there is going to be the emergence of something like a new myth. Um, uh, so it's one of the only resolutions, like I said, it on Thorson's podcast, there's going to be an image, some image that emerges in the domain of insolment at the collective level. Um, 
which coheres something like a new myth, which would have the potential to reworld us and remyth us. And all of a sudden now we're actually all together again in the same place, in the same time, knowing who we are. <laughs> Instead of believing that half a country is actually some species that we will never speak to. <laughs> right? Which is which yep. is where we are now. Um, of course. And, no, we're just trapped in our little ideologies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, unfortunately, many of these myths have involved. Um, the these scapegoating so now we're into Girard, right? The scapegoating dynamics, where in fact it is only through the mechanism of scapegoating where revealed the scapegoat's the savior and the new myth becomes visible. So that's my fear is that actually it's in the wake of humanistic catastrophe that the conscience of humanity again reweaves a myth to assure it doesn't happen again. Um, and uh, you know, yeah. So like we did that after World War II, right? Like there was no such thing as human rights before <laughs> the Human Rights Convention. <laughs> and, uh, and now the term has become degraded and there's a huge problem with it. And then we basically, in many ways, backtrack be, behind that innovation of the new myth of one world, human rights, right? So there is a way in which, yeah, after a catastrophe, we often find a way to, to come again under the umbrella of a shared mythos that's alive, like a living mythos. Um, anyway, so that was a little weird and prophetic, but uh, I feel- Well, like I'll just make the link. I mean, in terms of, in my myth, you know, the, the first principle, just to make the link of what you were saying, is dignity and dignity is the thing that justifies human rights in the United Human Rights Declaration. Right. You know, and that's, so at the, at the level of the kind of, um, the kind of mythos that does have that potential, that's, you know, that's what they did after that catastrophe. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. yeah, so I feel um, that was a beautiful, a beautiful dance there. Deeply appreciative of that. I feel as I often do as we get close to prearranged times to close things that I have to let go of all these different threads of insight and um, visions of seeing that of course some part of me so desperately wants to share but in another sense or at least the story I tell myself at least is that the process of withholding then is in some important sense absolutely bound up with what we've just been discussing in the sense that we can't or we should be very careful about jumping too far ahead of what the image to be realized is and yet and yet the point zach has just made which is analogous in some sense to the coming of the nuclear age and our collective seeing of the cataclysmic potential of that kind of technology. Well, we learned some things from that for a time. We'll see if we've remembered them. Maybe we haven't. But there's a sense in which you might forgive someone, you know, even those inclined towards Buddhahood, maybe, that it would be a good idea not to use a nuclear weapon to show us what it can do. And yet, now we consider, okay, the, because I, you know, that seems appropriate to me, the, like it has to be the case that the, make it some sort of technical point about archetypes, maybe, maybe dodge that, that a myth will come, a myth will be realized to make sense that can stand as the image that we can hold hands in relationship to, be in touch with, have a shared vision of, be illuminated by, trust in. And the point is, well, what if, <laughs> how to trust that moment of truthful expression authentic expression, sharing of vision, sharing of image, the combination between 
trusting in that expression of one's participation, contribution to that collective and manifestation of myth, factoring for the importance of influence, the foresight and the desire to influence so that we don't have to learn in some after-the-fact way of just what tragic consequence may be in store for us if we have to learn via reflection on the catastrophic potential of not heeding that mythos. You see what I'm trying to say? When, like, is there a moment, and this is something, Zach, that I, I wanted to talk to you about many months ago before we met, and it's an idea that I have to presence almost in a different way every time, and um, maybe I can't today, maybe I can't with five, ten minutes left, because this is where, for me, the most... Um, this is of the essence of doubt for me. Well, I mean, what I'm hearing is, you know, the urgency of the need to create the myth to avert mm -hmm. existential catastrophe combined with the sense that it's inevitable that a myth evolves mm -hmm. leads to the ambition to create the myth, right? Mm -hmm. Except that we know that the myth that we create can't be the, that myth. <laughs> And in fact, the, the great myths were never created by a single author. Like, it's just not how it works. So right. in fact, uh, what we're looking for is not to be the authors of the myth of the future. Like that, if you're, if you're thinking, if anyone's thinking that, like, turn that guy's volume down like, <laughs> and maybe get him out of here. Because like, that's a dangerous way to hold it. In fact, like what I'm pointing to is this thing, um, you know, like, uh, like the Mount Sinai metaphor is useful, right? Like one message came down, but all the Hebrews are surrounding the mountain and there were, you know, however many thousands of different views of the revelation, right? So it's about the uniqueification of the myth that emerges all between us in the middle of things. And it seeps then into the newosphere and saturates the identity structures. And precisely because it's not been created by someone, <laughs> but rather emerged at the level of collective psyche, um, that it's a myth that's alive and that lives in us. Um, that's why the intensity of experience. So like the flood myth is a great example of this. Like the flood myth exists all over. And the hypothesis is that probably because there were some pretty bad floods. <laughs> right. Well, the whole <laughs> and, Mediterranean and got, opened up. <laughs> exactly. And it got ingrained in humans like, whoa, man, like, God is maybe wrathful and like these things happen occasionally and people survive and that's amazing that people survive. And so you get this sense. And I think the flood myth is actually, it's one of the ones that I really resonate with um, the sense of the time between worlds being when you're on the ark. And one of the things I think about is needing to build something like an ark to get us through this period to the next anyway. So, but the point I'm making is that, yeah, the doubt uh, is appropriate. Like there, there it's not, it's up to us and not up to us. Um, and my sense is that it's probably not this generation that we are actually um, maybe destined to remain demythed and deworlded. But in fact, it is the next generation or the one after, which is anyway. So now I'm again completely speculating here. This is like right. me making stuff up, but uh, it just is just my intuition. Um, but yeah, the, the sense you have is uh, at least the one that I heard in my interpretation of it was that sense of like, how, how will this come about? What's my mm -hmm. responsibility mm -hmm. in it? Um, it's close. It's close. close. Yeah. I, it's close. And I agree with you. Um, but I'm also looking to push. I'm also looking to push here. I'm looking to push mm -hmm. you a little bit on this because I mean, you've just said that we may be destined to be demythed, and yet the collectively, in, not collectively. In, not necessarily individually or in small groups, but like as a as a large as a species, like um, right, that. right, right. Um, because of course, what what that expression was housed in was a myth of the ark to make sense of this moment. I.e., I'm sort of sensing. And feel a connectedness myself um, 
I suppose I think I'm speaking on behalf of all of us, actually, that there is actually a way to be in relationship with this moment that's deeply meaningful, that is seeking to contribute somehow and seeking to understand the right relationship of contribution, seeking to do that with others and collectively build an arc together. So <laughs> the way of relating to the cultural moment of demythification is obviously through this myth. But, <laughs> but that's, but, but I, the thing I want to push on is is that we and maybe my only way to relate to this thought again is through another myth which is that we have had we the the myths tell us that there have been moments where there has been revelations that have come to individuals now i agree with you that it would be inappropriate for us to reckon with that as a kind of soul authorship on behalf of one individual rather than we ought to see it as the individual contribution of many to the realization of patterns over long periods of time through many many deaths <laughs> and lives but but the thing i just want to the thing i the thing i want to push on is that there like i Ah, it's we did this the time. It's just I when I'm when I've been a part of deeply charged psychic environments, by that I mean there are people who are perhaps let, let's just take the example of inappropriately wielding teacherly authority, where there might be those in relation who have not the sovereignty, whether maybe because they're on some sort of psychedelic or maybe because they're in a suggestible state or they've been manipulated where they are in some sense being born along by the flow of another that's not to their own best interest right they might can be manipulated into something that's <laughs> there's so much movement that individuals in those environments can uh orient others to undergo and i look at transitionary moments and i look at how people bind into um, collective memes and I look at the lack of capacity to stand in one's integrity in an when the only thread of coherence is a not the only thread but one of the main threads of coherence is a string that's pulling you in the wrong direction and I get I get worried about that, and then I consider what ways we are how to reach someone on the brink like that. The point I'm getting is 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 the urgent that urgency element, that urgency element. The cure to the the cure to the false prophet is not to become a prophet. And uh, I think the other thing worth noting is like yeah, there are there are absolutely myths of revelation. Generally, you don't want to be that guy. So again, it's back to like, what's your role in the new, in the new myth? So if it is the case that it comes from an individual, you definitely don't want to be that guy. Like, don't sign me up for that. <laughs> but it has to come uh, through individuals. It has to come through to individuals come in the right individual. relationship. And that's, totally. the, and that's the thing. We're, we're trying to understand what the emergent context is. Right. We're right. not sure. We have to point out what that context is, right? It's, it's right. about like, what is this thing here? I don't know how it relates to everything else, but I have to speak truthfully as to this may be part of it. Could be totally wrong. But the sense of, of urgency, the sense of seeing, the sense of revelation of that, that has to be held appropriately in right context. And that speaks very importantly to what we spoke about at the beginning of what is this? Because I'm not saying that's what this is, but I'm saying that open source, public facing, and I'm saying privacy, I'm saying what, what's the middle ground where that kind of urgency, that kind of care can be held and transformed conduited appropriately that to me is is deeply deeply resonant and that, that's the kind of that's what has to be i think considered as well by both the impacts of that thought have to be shared in both directions open source and private that that's that thought doesn't make sense i i need to express that over a much longer period of time 
I mean, it makes sense to me, but I, you know, for a moment, <laughs> but I, not I in a. I hear you answering the question, like a question Jamie Wheel is trying to answer about how do you create an ethical cult, which is another way of saying how do you actually create a religion that's not pathological, um, and it's a deep question. And you're right, like um, individual creativity and charismatic leadership is a definitely a part of the equation, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, but at the same time, there is the collective field where the dysfunction arises and the dynamics of teacherly authority, which I've written about in my book on spiritual teachers and teachings in that essay mm. in the Time Between Worlds book. So there's some stuff there, but yeah, this is the hot button issue. There will be a lot of false prophets. That's basically what I'm suggesting. Uh, and there will be false prophets that are not even human beings. If you want to get into Pat Ryan's notion of the AI messiahs, um, so it's it's going to be complex. Which means that, uh, like I said, I don't think the solution to a false prophet is to be a prophet. It's actually to have a community full of prophetic voices. Um, I I agree uh, with you. I'm I'm not trying to put thoughts. at all any no. I'm not trying to communicate a perspective other than that. But I'm also trying to speak to what the roles are in the realization of the context of the community like yeah. so just to be just to be clear about that like totally no it's um, and it's this question of teacherly authority in the context of spiritual and religious discussions and that's where that stuff is most loaded you know like i saw in your thread actually greg on the theory of knowledge listserv the one about um uh, all are all white people racist and in that there was a buddhist teacher a famous buddhist teacher african-american buddhist teacher who in his book wrote to be white is to be racist mm -hmm. right and uh so this is interesting problematic from the perspective of what does responsible teacherly authority look like in a religious and spiritual context right mm -hmm. i'm not saying the guy's a false prophet um, but what i'm saying is that uh the dynamics of teacherly authority in those contexts of spiritual teaching are some of the stuff we really need to grapple with and quickly <laughs> because these new myths are going to come hot and heavy and new communities yeah. are going to form and you're going to get a lot of sociopaths attracted to that dynamic and to sort the wheat from the chaff in the domain of of the prophetic and the spiritual teacher is is super important and, and neglected and the most serious social scientists just won't touch it. <laughs> just like the scientists won't touch, uh, you know, um, weird uh, stuff that occurs uh, in right. meditation and, and transmission between teacher and student and things of that nature. So Greg, some last thoughts, I guess we're kind of wrapping up here. I mean, I, I you know, as I hear that, um, I, I'm drawn to, you know, we have to reflect on values. We have to reflect on sense making. We have to maintain good connection. It's going to be bumpy. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of false prophets. Um, I was, I, at the same time, I do feel like uh, what you were saying about, um, you know, the different perspectives on the mountain. I, I talk about, um, I'm drawn to the close encounters of the third kind uh, myth. Of, I feel like lots of people are seeing this time between worlds fifth joint point, you know, and I feel like there is an emerging collective where people are bringing the thread of tapestry um, that will lay the groundwork for the weave of whatever history looks back, whatever gets remembered in the future, and then becomes the story of whatever this was. Um, and I do, you know, my, my psyche looks out at the future. I feel unbelievably grateful for the being and presence that I happen to be pretty high water on, you know, in terms of my wife and kids and friends like you guys and be able to have these moments of two hours of just engagement and reflection and good beingness. Um, and then try to direct that energy um, as you look out at a horizon that I think can range from you know, a realistic heaven to a realistic hell. And I find that we are um, I don't know, in between <laughs> those worlds, Zach, uh, you know, your essay around COVID, you know, uh, just captured that beautifully. Um, so I just want to orient my baton of energy in the tapestry to be a part of a weave 
uh, that increases the likelihood that our future ancestors look back and say, well, at least we moved in the positive direction. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Greg. That was beautiful. And Zach as well, thank you so much for your energy and insight and reflectiveness. And um, to, to both of you, I, I can't um, speak um, highly enough of your work and um, just to express my gratitude for it and the learning, you know, it's afforded me um, in deep ways to bounce off and to calibrate. Um, and I continue to expect to do so on an ongoing basis. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much for the generosity of your time. And um, it's, uh, it's a real privilege for me. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please consider sharing them or leaving a review and perhaps also to consider supporting it on patreon.com slash voicecraft. Your support makes a life-changing difference and a life-affirming impact.